Welcome back to another mini episode of How Brands Are Built, the podcast where branding professionals get into the details of what they do and how they do it. I'm your host, Rob Meyerson. In the last episode, when I talked to Lauren and Myra of Character, I mentioned that Myra was also a guest in season three. What I failed to point out, however, is that that makes her the first repeat guest on How Brands Are Built. Thanks, Myra. And today, I'm already talking to my second repeat guest, none other than David Ocker, Professor Emeritus at the Haas School of Business, UC Berkeley, Vice Chair at Profit, a global marketing and branding consultancy, and author of over a dozen books and hundreds of articles about marketing and branding. Last time David was on, we talked about two of his books, Ocker on Branding, 20 Principles That Drive Success, and Creating Signature Stories. We also talked at length about his brand vision model. If you're interested in hearing that longer conversation with the father of modern branding, go take a listen. This time, we're talking about David's newest book, Owning Game-Changing Subcategories, Uncommon Growth in the Digital Age. Let's get started. David Ocker, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast again. My pleasure. So your new book, uh, which thank you for sending it, uh, sending me a copy, is Owning Game-Changing Subcategories, Uncommon Growth in the Digital Age. What's the central thesis of the new book? What, what is it all about and what will readers discover when they pick up the book? Well, the origin of the book came from my work in Japan. I got a hold of data on the Japanese beer industry and I looked over 30 years, there was only really three times in which the market trajectory changed and all of those could be explained by the creation of a new subcategory like Asahi Super Dry. Mm -hmm. I looked at automobiles, I looked at computers, I looked at a lot of other uh, product areas and, and the same sort of generalization kept emerging. Every time there was a sales spurt, uh, it could be explained by the development of a whole new set, subcategory. Uh, they really somehow changed the customer experience or changed the brand relationship in a meaningful way. So not necessarily just some new big brand entering the space, but specifically if it is a new brand or a new business, one that is introducing a new subcategory as opposed to just another maybe more competitive or, or um, faster moving company. Yeah, it really has to be something that changes the customer experience or brand relationship enough so it affects brand loyalty. So mm -hmm. people will start to avoid options that don't have these new characteristics. Great. You also sent a note. Uh, I don't know if you remember, but there's a little handwritten note that you um, popped into the book when you sent it over. And I want to read what you wrote on there and, and then have you talk about it. It says, one of the unique qualities of this book is that unlike other strategy books looking at disruption or innovation or growth, this book introduces branding as strategy and as tactics. What did you mean by that? This sort of book talks about a, a subject, disruption, innovation, growth that's been um, covered in a lot of other books. But if you look at the index in those books, they never have branding in them. Mm. They don't mention branding. And yet, in my, uh, in my research, I've concluded that uh, if you want to be successful at really growing uh, with a subcategory based platform, um, you, you you need branding. There, there needs to be an exemplar brand. That's got to be your goal, to become the brand that represents the subcategory. And the exemplar brand needs to position the category, first of all. It needs to elevate what I call must-haves, these, these mm -hmm. special qualities. And um, it has to scale and uh, create buzz in the marketplace, create a customer-based uh, uh a set of loyal customers, and it has to create barriers to others. And these are all branding tasks, and you can use the concepts and the methods of branding to do that. And, and if you don't do any of, one of those things, it, it's just not going to work. And, uh, and, and I think it's, it's uh, really kind of a, a dramatic uh, failure that hmm. these other books on strategies and other great thought leaders – you know, they uh, they don't have a branding background. They don't have a marketing background. And they 
they uh, think in different terms, and I think they really miss something. So plenty of books out there about uh, disruption and growth and, and plenty of books about branding, of course, but maybe this is one of the few, if not the only book that really combines those two ideas. I think it is. Yes. You've dropped a couple of key terms from the book already. So let's go through those one by one, because I want to make sure that um, that I understand and that our listeners understand. So first, let's let's just talk about subcategory since it's in the title of the book. And I think we all know, you know, have a sort of basic familiarity with what a subcategory is. But since it's such an important premise in the book, how do you define what is and what isn't a subcategory? And then is there a difference between a game-changing subcategory and just any other subcategory? Yeah. Well, uh, uh, let me give you uh, three characteristics. First of all, uh, there has to be a, a new sort of uh, a feature that that changes the customer experience, like Prius did, like Tesla did, like uh, Enterprise Rent-A-Car did. Mm-hmm. Or, and it has to have a, a new kind of brand relationship, like uh, Patagonia did with their environmental uh, interests, like Sephora did with their interest in beauty, and Dove did with their self-esteem. So it has to be something that really is valued and ties them to the brand. Second, it, it's, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be transformational. It doesn't have to be Cirque du Soleil. It can <laughs> be, uh, you know, light and fit, fit Greek yogurt. It can be, yeah. uh, it can be a substantial change in, in what, it, but can, it can retain what is going on right now. It doesn't have to be a completely new thing. And, and that's uh, a lot of the other books on strategy focus on transformational change. But substantial change can also work. The third thing is that it's, uh, it can, it's contrasted with uh, the alternative way to compete, which I call my brand is better than your brand strategy. Right. And, and my assertion is that uh, that almost never generates growth. It makes me think of the cola wars, sort of, the just yes. competing based on we're better than you. Yes, or the, you know, the, uh, the phone wars before t right. came in and disrupted the category. So another term that you mentioned there that, that I know features heavily in the book is exemplar brand. And you actually start the book off with a handful of examples of brands that I assume you're, you're saying are, are doing exactly what you um, would recommend, or at least some of what you would recommend in this book. So Etsy and Warby Parker and Nest. Can you talk a little bit about, uh, just pick one maybe that, that's a favorite and what they're doing right and why they classify as, as an exemplar brand for their subcategory? Well, yes, they, they have, uh, uh, exemplar brand has a couple of, uh, of qualities. It's, it's almost always the early market leader, and not necessarily a pioneer. In fact, it's rarely the pioneer, but the early market leader, the first to get it right, and it becomes the thought leader, the innovator, the one that talks about the subcategory instead of their brand and uh, kind of ignores the other brands as being irrelevant. Mm. And uh, the, the winners emerge as, as the only relevant brand or at least um, the, the most relevant brand. So uh, an example might be uh, Dollar Shave Club. Uh-huh. You know, it started in 2012. Uh, it was the the uh, feisty uh, underdog. It was uh, irreverent. It was humorous. Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, four years later, you know, they were sold for a billion dollars by Unilever to Unilever. Uh, remarkable success story. But yeah. uh, one of the uh, things they did was to create a uh, ninety second video. I to still remember it. <laughs> describe the uh, new subcategory. In 48 hours, they got 12,000 subscribers. Yeah, it was a very funny, very funny video. And today, that's got 26 and a half million viewers, uh, wow. you know, some like eight years later. But, um, and second of all, they, they really had a simple offering. It, it started off with a, uh, a one choice, and it, it now has three choices, but Amazon for the same. Uh, application has 12,000 choices, you know, hmm. you really don't want 12,000 choices. That's better <laughs> things in life to do. And the third thing they did was to, uh, to highlight in that video, the convenience and low price of their offering, as opposed to going into a 
drugstore and going into a locked, uh, trying to unlo- get somebody to unlock uh, the the container that the blades are hiding behind, and then trying to figure out the bewildering selection and which one works with your razor. Right, right. And, uh, uh, so they really have some uh, really amazing uh uh, it's what I call must-haves. Let's talk about must-haves, and specifically because you mentioned that it's nice to be the first in a subcategory. I guess that's the um, that's sort of the ultimate way to be the exemplar brand is if you literally created the subcategory by doing something no one had done before. But I take it that you don't always have to do it that way. Sometimes brands come along and kind of rise up to that status in some other way. And I guess that it must be because they're doing more things right uh, along the lines of these must haves. So uh, here's a quote from the book. You wrote that the only way to grow is to innovate by developing must haves that define a new game changing subcategory. So can you just explain what must haves are and how can companies go about developing them? Well, a must have is, is really defined by uh, customer loyalty. It's a feature or a nature, some kind of brand relationship that means so much to a core customer base that they'll be loyal to that, uh, to to those options they perceive as having those must-haves. They, there's there's really two sources of them. Sometimes there's a sort of a, a customer-driven where the customer need is so dramatic like it was in this Dollar Shave Club. I mean, the Gillettes of the world were priced and and distributed in such a way that was just really painful. It was a market begging to be disrupted. So sometimes the need is obvious, and the only problem is, can you create something to deliver on that need? The other uh, source of of must-haves are come out of, through new technology or just new ideas, create a new offering, and uh, sometimes you don't even have to test them, but they, they're, they're going to work. So that was the case with Asahi Super Dry. It was a new, crisp, dry, a little bit higher alcohol a beverage, and uh, it, it was just simply different. Mm-hmm. Uh, it can be a failed idea that, uh, you know, somebody's out there like Sony had an iPod before Apple. Microsoft <laughs> had an iPad before Apple did. Mm-hmm. So Apple observed those things and saw them struggling in the marketplace, and they, then Steve Jobs realized now the technology is right; we can do this right. Right. And, and then he generated a success. Uh, sometimes it seems like Apple's whole business model is waiting to see uh, what other innovations other companies have come up with, and then improving upon them, waiting until they can do it much better and really become the exemplar for that subcategory, whether it's the iPod or the iPhone or the iPad, they, they keep doing this over and over again. Now, even with the watch, they there were plenty of quote unquote smart watches out there, but I don't think we could name too many of them other than Apple's. Apple is incredible. Apple has created new subcategories at least eight or nine times yeah. in, in the last few decades, and, and no other firm has come close to that. And um, it's, it's simply remarkable, and you're right. In, in almost none of these cases was there any technological breakthrough. Uh, they were just on top of the technology, and they picked the, the they got the timing right. Right. And uh, and they and they just did it again and again and again. And incidentally, they never tested any of these things. <laughs> um, Steve Jobs didn't believe in market testing, but he believed he had so much faith in his understanding of technology, his understanding of the marketplace, that uh, he was inevitably right. One other um, the topic I want to cover on the book is is actually mentioned in the subtitle. So the book's also about what you call the digital factor. And that subtitle, again, is Uncommon Growth in the Digital Age. So what is the digital factor and how does it relate to these game-changing subcategories? Well, I tell you, I, was, I wrote this book about a year ago and my daughter said, you know, you, you can't put out this book. You've got nothing in digital in there. <laughs> and uh, so I spent a year rewriting it. And um, what I learned during that process is that digital indeed has completely changed this whole concept of subcategory uh, growth platforms. Uh, the creation of subcategories and their impact has is, is sort of on steroids now. I mean, there's, there's uh, many times uh, more 
that existed before, and their impact is much uh, greater, and their speed of development is so much more. Yeah. And, and there's four reasons for that. One is that just the technology. We've got the Internet of Things. We've got advances in voice and GPS and the, the, use, the, the, the number of users of the Internet, the iPhone, the smartphones, and so on have just exploded, and that leaves a whole bunch of opportunities to do things you couldn't do before. And the second is is e-commerce. I mean, it wasn't too long ago that if you wanted to introduce a new concept, you had to create a whole new sales force, or you had to find a way to get into storefronts or even create storefronts yourself. I mean, the cost and time was, was enormous. Now we've got e-commerce. Yeah, it's a couple of clicks away yeah. now. Airbnb, when they started, they had an e-commerce site up in 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 a week. Mm-hmm. It cost them nothing. And then there's uh, uh, there's social media and websites. I mean, it, it wasn't too long ago if you wanted to introduce a new concept, you needed a media plan and a media budget, and that took a long time and tens of millions of dollars. Now you got social media. You have Dollar Shave Club that was up and running in 48 hours with a, a video that cost $4,600 to make. And, and finally, there's uh, what I call brand communities. And these are, are sort of groups of people that bond over something that they're interested in or some activity or some passion. And uh, they bond with, a, with others with a like uh, inclination. They bond with a brand. And, uh, and they're really enabled by digital. Right. Because of the, the website, because of social media. Right. So th- these these communities presumably always existed, but the fact that they can now organize so easily online and, and kind of amplify themselves through creating memes or sharing things about the brand with other people has changed dramatically as a result of digital. Well, some existed, like the uh, Harley uh, right. Oldest Group existed, but... Uh, they were really only uh, uh, relegated to charismatic brands, and and it was uh, very uh, difficult to create and sustain a community. But now, uh, sort of anybody can do it. Right. And uh, if you're clever and you strike a chord, yeah, you're there. <laughs> Great. Well, just one last question for you, David. If there's one piece of advice out of this book that you're really hoping that brand leaders and business people will take to heart, what, what would you say that is? Well, I, I would say that it's really important to think big, uh, at least part of the time, and not, uh, not think small all the time. And think in terms of uh, you know marginal improvements of your product and a little better advertising, a little better promotions. But once in a while, think big. And so look for opportunities to create subcategory platforms, uh, new ways to looking at what the customer is using and, and their relationship with the brand. And, uh, and when you see one, you know, think long and hard before you turn your back on it. Mm-hmm. And uh, take some risks and uh, make some investments, make some commitments, because that's really the only way to grow. All right. I like it. I hope we see more brands taking your advice. Thank you so much again for joining me. Again, the book is Owning Game-Changing Subcategories, Uncommon Growth in the Digital Age. David Ocker, thanks again. Thanks, Rob. Thanks for listening to this mini episode of How Brands Are Built. Owning Game-Changing Categories is available now on Amazon and elsewhere. I'll add links in the show notes for the episode. You can also find David at davidocker.com, that's spelled A-A-K-E-R, or on LinkedIn or Twitter. If you like what you heard today, please consider leaving a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. And I'd love it if you'd follow along on social media. Visit the site at howbrandsarebuilt.com for show notes, blog posts, the newsletter sign up, and more. How Brands Are Built is a production of Heirloom Agency, LLC. Our logo and original podcast artwork is by Joel Sherlow, with additional design work by Lacey Honda. Web development by Matias Garrido. Our theme music is by Isha Erskine Project. Thanks again for tuning in to this mini episode. I'm Rob Meyerson, and I'll talk to you next time.